one in particular. It's at a beautiful venue. Pretty much everybody's staying in the hotel here. And so that means, you know, after the sessions, people are going out and getting a beer and continuing the conversation. And you know, it's just a great way to experience the conference. Welcome to your third day of CPPCon. Uh, at this point, we've gone, we've completed two days, so your brain should be about 40% full. But if you're like me and have not been pacing yourself, you're probably around 80 or 90%. So, <clears throat> we're going to talk a little bit about actors and writers. Uh, for those of you who have been living under a rock for the last six months, the uh, Writers Guild uh, of America and the Screen Actors Guild have been on strike. The Writers Guild recently settled their strike. They were looking for better contracts from the movie studios and t TV studios. So what can they tell us about software development? Good programs require good contracts. Okay. So the corollary is that a good contract requires good enforcement. And then I'll further make the observation that good enforcement requires good oversight. So bringing this into the software realm, to enforce a contract, you want to have contract checks in your code that catch bugs early in the process. And we should all know that catching bugs early in the process is much better than catching them when they're in your customer's hands, right? The contracts themselves need to be checked. They have to be tested during unit testing. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So this is what we want you to know by the end. We're going to be talking about three somewhat independent things and then kind of tying them together and seeing how they connect. We're going to talk about the no accept specifier, which at first may seem to be not unrelated to contracts, but in fact is very important. Then we'll talk about writing contracts themselves and then how to test those contracts, test those contract annotations. And then we'll look at how NoAccept interacts with the testing of contract checking annotations. OK, if you didn't get all that, we're going to go every, over everything twice. We're going to go over everything twice. <laughs> and what I mean by that is we're going to do kind of a surface level coverage. And then we're going to go more in depth. So if you want to leave in the middle, that's OK. But make sure it's the, mi the middle before you leave. I'll let you know. All right, a little bit about us. Us. There's two of us. Well, Timur is in Finland right now, awaiting the birth of their, I think, first child. So I don't know what got into him, but he decided that was more important than coming to CPPCon. Um, <laughs> And he will be joining us via a pre-recorded video. Okay, he is a member of the Standards Committee. He is the chair of the Contract Study Group in the Standards Committee. You can see his other uh, credentials there. I am also a member of the C++ Standards Committee, um, in, uh, mostly in the Library Evolution Working Group, and um, have contributed to some books, including Embracing Modern C++ Safely, which I recommend to all of you because the parts of the book that I didn't write are really great. And I won't tell you what the parts I did write uh, or contribute to. Um, OK. <clears throat> Let's get into it. So we're just going to review the language feature itself of noaccept without judgment for the moment. The noaccept specifier is used to say, this function will not throw. So we have three things here that will not throw. The is numeric function, just a plain old free function, or it might be a member function of some class. It's declared no accept. You see the no accept. Where's my timer up? That's easier. OK. Right there at the end. Um, the move constructor for my class is no accept. And that's an important example, because that's the most common use of no accept is for move constructors. And the destructor is no accept. And notice that the, there is no decorator. There's no noaccept decorator on the destructor. But that's because destructors are automatically noaccept unless you tell 
the compiler otherwise. The callers don't have to defend against exceptions when calling a noaccept function. So for example, we have here, we're allocating an array of integers, and then we're calling this function. Now, normally I'd be afraid the function might throw, and that array is gonna become a dangling point, it's gonna be a, a, a pointer to memory that can never be reclaimed, right? But I don't have to worry about it in this case because the is numeric function that has been declared, it will not throw. Now, the things in the ellipses there, these dot, 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 uh, they may throw, so obviously you have to be careful. Make sure that all the operations there are not drawing. And then at the end, we delete the array, and we're good. No except can be conditional. That is to say, a compile time constant can tell you, is this function no except or not? And we, that, that's the shortcut terminology I'll be using. A function is no except if it is decorated with no except, right? So the first function, f1, is no except true, so it will not throw. The second function, f2, is no except false, so it might throw. And then that destructor there is no except false, so it might throw, and this is the only way you can declare a throwing destructor, because by, as I mentioned on the previous slide, destructors are automatically no except. When would you use this? Well, one reason you'd use it is for destructors, but generally you use it in generic code, template code, to decide whether a function might throw based on some compile time attribute of one of the template parameters, or the, what we say, call a dependent type. So if the size of t, in this case, uh, for our allocate function, if it's less than our small object size, we're just gonna get memory from our little small object buffer, and we know that that will not throw. So that's, well, that, that expression here will evaluate to true, and this will be a, non, a, a no except function. On the other hand, if it's larger than our small object buffer, then we're gonna go to the heap, and we may exhaust memory, and then we'll get a bad alloc exception, and so in that case, this will evaluate to false, and this will be a function that is allowed to throw. Clear? So what happens if you're in the no except context, that is you're inside of a function that is declared no except, and something does throw? Well, if an exception tries to escape, terminate is called, std terminate, which ends your program. Right? You are allowed to put in some stuff to, to to do some kind of cleanup before the program actually exits, but you cannot continue after this point, All right? Does this mean that this function will terminate? No, because the length error exception only happens when your size is greater than 300, right? So most of the time it will not. So that means that it's okay to have a throw expression or to call a possibly throwing function inside of a no except function provided you never actually hit the condition that causes the exception to occur. But then if you do hit that condition, it will, it will terminate your program. All right, so our first example, we're passing in a, a five character string, and uh, that's much less than 300, so it's not gonna throw. Right? And if it doesn't throw, it's not gonna terminate, so we're good. Then we create this long string, and we pass it to the same function that is numeric again, and in this case, it will terminate the program because we'll hit that conditional, we'll evaluate the true, it'll throw, the throw is not allowed to escape the is numeric function, and it'll terminate. Now the no except decorator is of limited utility if it were not for the no except operator. The no except operator says, is this thing no except? And the argument to that operator is an expression it's not a function name, so be careful, that's, that's an easy mistake to make, because if you pass a function name in to the no except operator, it'll evaluate as a function pointer, which is always true. So be careful, and tr it's true is a Boolean, and it's, anyway, that expression doesn't throw. Converting a function to a pointer is a non-throwing expression, so be careful there. I think, I think I've done this and compilers have warned me, but don't quote me on that. 
Um, OK, so our first expression is a plus b, uh, where a and b are both integers. Integer arithmetic does not throw an exception. Therefore, no except returns true, and the static assert is good. Our second case is we're calling empty on a vector. Well, the empty function is declared no except in the standard. And therefore, this expression, uh, no except of v dot empty, is true, and the static assert is, is good. The pushback function, however, is not declared no except. At least, it doesn't have to be. The standard uh, is a little funny about this because it allows the implementations to add no except where the standard does not require it. And so this may or may not fail. Um, but in, in a good implementation, in my opinion, this will fail. No except of pushback will say false, and the static assert will fail. You'll get a compile time error. Right, so that's what the no except operator is. Now, you wouldn't use it for static assert. Typically, you, you might. You might have situations where an operation has to be no except, otherwise other parts of the logic are dangerous, whatever. But typically, it's not for static assert. What typically is, it's used is for optimization. We'll show you that in a minute. OK, the expression inside the no except operator is it's like size of. It doesn't actually evaluate the expression. It just looks at the, the no acceptness of the expression itself. So like size of expression doesn't evaluate the expression. It just says, what's the size of the return type of that expression or the type that you give it? And no except of an expression does not call the expression. So a true result is, like I said, it's used to make a, an algorithm more performant at, at runtime. Okay. It is a programmer choice to, to take advantage of the no except operator. And we'll get back to that in detail in the second half of the talk. Let's now switch gears back to the original topic, contracts, and then contract checking. What's a contract? Well, a contract is in, in software is not that different from a contract in any, any natural language like English. It's, it's, a, it's a promise. You know, you do this, and I'll do that. If you do this, I will do that. If you give me 1,000 widgets, I will pay you $10,000. Right? That's a contract. In software, uh, a function contract is a set of preconditions, something that has to be true before the function is called. That is the caller's responsibility to make sure that those things are true. And then the post condition is, this is what I will do for you. This is what this function will do for you. This is what state it will leave the world when it returns. So the popback function in vector, and we'll be using vector as an example a lot, it has a precondition that the vector is not empty. Right? You're not allowed to remove the last element of, a, of an empty vector. And the post condition is that the last element has been removed. Now there's two kinds of contracts, narrow and wide contracts. A wide contract is one that doesn't have any preconditions. The example I give here is integer addition. Your unsigned integer addition, sorry. You're allowed to add any two unsigned numbers. It will produce a result. It will not throw an exception. It will not crash your program. It'll produce a well-defined result, not just any result. Okay. If you wrap around, that is part of the language. Uh, vector size has no preconditions. So long as you have a val valid vector, you can ask what size is this. A narrow contract is one that does have preconditions. So signed integer addition has the precondition that it will not overflow or underflow, which is a funny precondition. You're kind of talking about a precondition in terms of its post conditions, but it is true. You are not allowed to add two integers which, if added together, would overflow the integer range. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Too relaxed up here. Um, so. Uh, that's a precondition. And if you violate that precondition, you get undefined behavior. Now, not everybody knows this, but if you, because typically when you add two integers and you get overflow, something happens that is somewhat predictable, but it doesn't have to be predictable. 
The compiler is allowed to do anything with that. Vector front has a precondition. You're not allowed to get the first element of an empty vector. If a precondition is violated, you get undefined behavior. Now, undefined behavior is a funny one. There's really kind of two kinds of, of undefined behavior. There's language undefined behavior, and that's like your integer addition. The compiler is allowed to generate any kind of code it wants, uh, assuming that you're not going to violate the precondition. And if you do violate the precondition, any th weird thing might happen. That's language undefined behavior. <laughs> Library undefined behavior is you violate the precondition of a function. And that function may or may not invoke language undefined behavior in its pr processing, but you still don't know what's going to happen. So as far as you're concerned, as a client of these things, undefined behavior is just, you assume it's bad. Now, one thing about undefined behavior is that the post conditions don't have to hold. That should be obvious in terms of anything might happen, right? But it's worth noting that if I contracted to buy 1,000 widgets from you and you don't deliver the 1,000 widgets, I don't have to give you your $10,000, okay? The post conditions hold only if the preconditions hold. In software, a violation of a contract is always a bug in the code. Now, the kind of bug it might be is you failed to scrub your inputs, okay? And so you might think of it as a bug in the input, but it's not a bug in the input. The failure is you didn't scrub it. It's a bug in the code. Somebody didn't meet their precondition or some function didn't do what it needed to do to meet its post conditions. So, like any other bug, catching a contract violation early is a good thing to do, right? You don't want to get it before it goes into the field. Some preconditions and postconditions can actually be tested. They can be written in code. And others, not so much. So for example, it's really easy to check for a null pointer. So easy, in fact, that if you are not allowing a null pointer in your function, you should basically always check it because it costs on the modern processor zero time. Your, your, your uh, what do they call it? The, when, the, when the processor figures out uh, that, you, that this thing always evaluates true, it, what's that? Branch prediction, thank you. I just blanked on it for a minute. The branch predictor on modern processors is so good that you will not be able to measure the cost of checking for a null pointer in, in most modern processors. Okay. On the other hand, the array for like binary search, the precondition is the input array has to be sorted. Right? That is kind of expensive to check. And it might be something that you might check like in a super debug build, but it's not something you want in your production build, that's for sure. Something like a approach condition that, you, that the output is a random number, well, how do you check that? I mean, you can't check it for a single function call. There are statistical methods for checking for randomness that involves calling this a million times, but that's different. You can't do that in a post condition check. Now, for those things that you can check for, how do you do it? Here, we're going to be used going back to vector, and we're implementing a vector during this thing. By the end of this, we will have about 10% of vector implemented. The popback function for vector has a precondition that the vector is not empty. All right, so the first thing we do is check that precondition. We look at the size, and if the size is not greater than zero, our assert will fire. So we're using C assert to check our precondition. And then we do the actual work. We're destroying the last element. And then we check that we have one less element. Nobody gets it. Okay, I'll show you in a minute what's going on here. All right, so now let's check this. What happens? We create an empty vector, and then we call pop back. Now, because the size of the vector is zero, our cert is going to fire and the program will terminate. But wait, there's more. I don't know if any of you saw this, but there's a bug in this code. This post condition will always fail. 
What happened? We, we forgot to decorate the size, okay? So this assert could prevent a bad pushback from going into the field, right? I mean, before you've written even the simplest unit test, just this one little unit test would catch this like right away, right away. The dumbest, po most poorly designed unit test that, that created a vector of one element and did a pop back on it would catch this error. All right, so now let's talk about contract annotations in, in general. All right, we just saw using the assert macro from C, venerable old assert, still works, still works. It's not very configurable. The only thing choice you have is ignore it or terminate the program if the condition fails. All right, more sophisticated libraries would have more sophisticated macros and these are just sort of some potential example names. Like maybe there's just one macro that's like capital assert or something like that. Or maybe there's different macros for checking th different things. By the way, a precondition check and a postcondition check are just two of the three kinds of checks you might want. The third is an invariant check. Somewhere in your code, something must be true. And that's where we typically call it something like assert or invariant or something like that. All right. A third possibility is the standard make change, and that is something that we're actively working for, working towards. There are, is a study group that has been working for many years to try and create, have preconditions and postconditions and invariant assertions in the language. And that has certain advantages because if the compiler knows that something must be true, it can, it can take certain actions, uh, optimizations and deliberate pessimizations occasionally uh, based on these checks. Okay, so we, have, we haven't settled on the syntax as far as I know yet. Uh, the, the two big candidates are this attribute-like syntax, and I say attribute-like because they're not technically attributes, um, or this other syntax with the curly braces and these names. And I'm not even sure the names themselves are solid. All right, so how did this interact with testing? These contract checking annotations, which I will from, from now on say CCA because I'm tripping over that long term anyway in my mouth, they can be a source of bugs too. So they have to be part of your unit test. All right, what I mean by it may be a source of bugs. Well, if you get the condition wrong, you can either crash your program when it was perfectly valid, or you could miss uh, a precondition check, and in which case, what's the point? Right? If, if you're missing the actual bug you're trying to catch, then, then you failed. So you want to check your, you want to actually unit test your pre and post conditions. We will eventually get to how no except can interfere with this kind of unit testing. Now, I'm about to turn the floor over to Timmer by video. Um, and while he's talking, you're going to be thinking of, yeah, but we could get around that. This you, you're wrong. Okay, all right. We have thought about these alternatives. No except will interfere. <laughs> so, at this point, I'm going to hand over to Timur. Take it away. Hello, everybody. My name is Timur Dumla. Unfortunately, due to several reasons, I cannot be at CppCon in person this year. So I pre-recorded my part of the talk so that Pablo can pay, play it back for you. And I wanna talk about unit testing. So I hopefully don't have to convince anybody that unit testing is great, that it's a very important technique to keep the quality of your code high and to uh, prevent bugs from being introduced. Contract is actually another technique to achieve that. So they're kind of complement each other. You should definitely um, use both in your code base. But contracts and unit testing are also connected in a particular uh, way, which is something that we see when we um, try to unit test a function that has a narrow contract. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to use vector front as an example. Uh, so vector front, that's an easy one. Uh, it has a precondition that the vector is not empty, right? Like calling front on an empty vector is undefined behavior. So vector front has a narrow uh, contract. So let's go ahead um, and test it. And what I really like doing is this kind of TDD test-driven development where I actually write the test first and then 
write the code that makes a test pass and then write the next test, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, here I'm going to have the test code on the left and the production code on the right. And I want to implement a test checking that vector front does its job. So how do we do that? Well, pretty straightforward. We uh, create a vector with a bunch of elements in that in there, and then we uh, call vector front and check that it returns the first element. Right? So that's hopefully uh, straightforward. Uh, this test is going to fail because we don't actually we didn't actually implement vector front yet. So let's go ahead and do that. We're just going to return the first a reference to the first element in whatever internal data array our vector implementation has, and that's going to make the test pass. So everything's great, except of course there's another really important line of code that we need to add there. Since vector front has a precondition, you want to add a precondition check. And so that's really important. And uh, we can hopefully, when uh, we get standard contracts in a language, hopefully with C++26, we will be able to do that with a standard contract annotation. Uh, right now, we could do it with CAssert, which is a bit limited. So pretty much every code base um, I've ever worked on, I'm sure your code base does this too, has some kind of custom assert macro, which is a little bit more clever than CAssert. Uh, so we're going to do that here. We're going to add an assert, uh, um, a check that our precondition is actually fulfilled as the first thing in our function body. And this is a really, really important line of code because uh, if you put that line of code there and somebody else uses uh, your function uh, out of contract and they try to call a vector front on an empty vector, uh, then if they have assertions enabled, which they probably will uh, in, in debug mode or in whatever other mode they're, they're writing their code in, um, then that assert is going to fire if they get it wrong, right? And that's going to prevent them from actually introducing a potential bug that's going to crash your program or do something even worse than that, maybe some subtle UB somewhere, uh, into your code base, right? So it's really, really important to add that line of code there to prevent this bug from uh, being added later by whoever's going to use uh, your function. And uh, like every really important line of code, we should write a test for it, right? So it's just like with any other piece of code that does something meaningful and important, we should unit test it, right? So that's the same thing for precondition checks. We should unit test our precondition checks. Why? Well, as I already said, it's code. It's important code. Uh, so we need to write a test for it. It ensures that users of your API are not going to introduce bugs by calling a function out of contract. Um, and actually, it also helps you because if you write a test for your precondition check, it ensures two things. It ensures that you did not forget to write that precondition check, right? If you get into a habit of writing a test for every precondition check that you write, it's going to make it a lot less likely that you're going to forget to write that, that check, which you know, would be bad, as we said. And also, it guarantees that you wrote it correctly, right? So you can kind of like test, OK, does this check now pass or does it fail? And so it helps you to write the precondition check correctly to get your preconditions right, right? And uh, ideally, uh, what you want to do is uh, you want to write that test first, because that also actually makes you think about what kind of precondition checks you need before you actually introduce them, right? So that's very much in the spirit of, of test-driven development. So how do we test our preconditions? Well, uh, we need to write some kind of test case here uh, that if we call a vector front on an empty vector, that that assert is actually going to fire, right? So we need some kind of uh, test macro I'm going to call it require assert fail. We're just going to test uh, that condition, right? And then, you know, when that assert macro on the right hand side actually fires, it should somehow, uh, you know, return control to the unit testing framework um, so that the unit testing framework can verify that the assert, in fact, has fired. And so, what we need to do here is we need to, uh, when the assert is being hit, not continue executing the function, right? So, uh, that would be UB, right? We would um, try to, like, uh, access this uh, data zero uh, element there, which doesn't exist, that would probably crash the program or lead to some other form of UB. So we don't want to go into continuing into that function body. You want to get out of the uh, function as soon as we hit that assert and, and the condition fails, uh, other than by returning a value, right? So we need to get out of that function, return control to the call side, uh, other than by returning a value, right? Hmm, do we have a mechanism in a C++ language that does this? Uh, well, we do, right? We have exceptions. They're exactly for this kind of thing. Uh, you know, introduce a different form of control flow, which instead of continuing the function and returning a value, 
just gets us out of there and back to the call side with uh, you know, some kind of information about what actually went wrong. So uh, what we can do here is we can now implement our cert macro um, to check the condition and then uh, throw an exception if the condition failed, right? And we're gonna do that in our test assertions mode. Uh, you can have other modes where this assertion macro is doing uh, all kinds of other things. You could log and terminate, which is what tassert does by default. You could log and keep going. You could uh, trigger a breakpoint in your ADE. You could uh, just completely ignore the assertion, which is something that you typically would do in release mode, right? Or you can even assume it to squeeze a little bit uh, more performance out of your code. Um, but in test assertions mode, we're just going to throw an exception. And then um, on the other side, on the, on the testing framework side, we can then very easily uh, implement our require sort fail macro by just saying, well, that's just going to check if that uh, exception has in fact been thrown, right? And every C++ unit testing framework uh, that I know of gives you this require throws macro or something else to check that an exception has actually been thrown of a certain type. And so we get that functionality kind of out of the box and implementing this require sort fail macro is, is one line of code, right? Uh, so you could also additionally put more info in this, into this assert fail exception about like which line of code, uh, where the assertion failed and, and like what happened, kind of more information. Uh, I'm gonna skip that for now, but, but you, can, you can do that, right? And so with that require sort fail macro, uh, Everything's great, right? We have our assert in there, and then we can test that the assert fires if uh, the vector front has been called out of contract. So we can test that we wrote the assert correctly. And then, you know, if the preconditions are satisfied, we have more tests to verify that the functionality of the function when called in contract is actually also correct. So that's exactly what I think everybody should be doing. This is great. There was, however, exactly one problem. Uh, what if somebody notices that, hmm, a vector front just returns a, a reference to an array uh, member, right? So uh, it never throws an exception. So uh, why don't we uh, add a no except in there? This is something that you know, somebody might want to do if they know that you know, returning a reference to an array element is not going to throw an exception. But now our whole testing strategy is just completely not going to work anymore, right? Because when our assert macro is going to throw uh, an exception in test uh, assertions mode, that exception is going to slam against the no except and it's going to call terminate. And that's going to bring down our whole testing suite. So that's really, really bad. That kind of completely destroys our testing strategy here, right? So that's why uh, we have the Lakers rule, um, which says that if you have a function with a narrow contract, a function with uh, preconditions, uh, we should not. Uh, market no except, even if you know that the function is never going to throw an exception when called in contract, right? So what we do instead is we document that it does not throw. And in the C++ standard library, we've been doing this for ages and ages, right? If you look into the uh, standard, uh, all of these narrow contract functions like operator square bracket or front uh, that have preconditions and we know they're not going to throw anything if they're called correctly, uh, the specification says that they're going to throw nothing, but there is no no except on that function, right? And so this is by far not the only reason why the Lakers rule is a really good idea and really good design guideline. There are other uh, reasons as well. Uh, there are very, probably this whole testing thing is even not the most important uh, reason why the Lakers rule is uh, a very good idea. Uh, here's a few papers about the Lakers rule. The first one uh, by John Lakers himself. Um, actually talks about another, I would say, even more important kind of engineering reason why the Lakers rule is a really good idea, which has nothing to do with testing. So I really encourage you uh, to read that paper. Uh, what I'm going to focus now, though, is what's in the second paper, which I co-authored uh, about um, kind of the testing, the testing situation. And so uh, the testing uh, stuff is all about, well, what do we do is if there is a no except there? And um, I have actually been in that situation myself. Um, I have worked on a code base where I was writing my precondition checks and everything was great. And then we had this uh, DSP engineer on the team who was writing high performance algorithms. And uh, he insisted that there should really be a no except there because you know, this function cannot throw an exception. And somehow the no except is going to make his code go faster, even though he never actually showed me a uh, benchmark uh, proving that. 
Um, but uh, the no accept was there, so I had to deal with it. I couldn't write my precondition checks in this way, so I had to figure out some kind of alternative, or I had to try and figure out some kind of alternative. So that brought me to the question whether there actually is any alternative to exception-based uh, precondition testing, uh, which is what we saw just now, which, and which requires us to follow the Lagos rule. So I, I was diving into this quite deeply and trying to figure out uh, alternatives or workarounds. Um, and the first thing that I came up with uh, was, well, why don't we wrap the no accept into another macro, uh, which I'm going to call my no accept, and then in test assertions mode, uh, it switches the no accept off so we can throw our assert fail macro and in other contexts, such as in production, where performance matters, even though I don't actually think uh, no accept necessarily does anything for performance. Um, you should really show me a benchmark to convince me of that, but that's another story. Um, anyway, so in release mode, uh, we would then turn this no accept on. And so then instead of um, decorating all your functions with no accept, you decorate them with this my no accept macro. And this kind of works, but it's a really bad approach. And it turns out I'm actually not the uh, first person who's thought of this approach, in fact, libc++, the Clang implementation of the standard library, they had exactly the same thing going on. They had, um, they wanted to write precondition checks. They had no accept all over the place, which they couldn't remove because of backwards compatibility. So they just replaced the no accept with this no accept debug macro, which did exactly the thing that I just showed. And then they found out that was not a good idea, and they had actually a patch that removed it again. And here's uh, like an excerpt. Uh, here's like some some text from the, the code review uh, of the patch where they removed it again. And I really like the last paragraph here. It says, having thought more and grown wiser, no accept debug was a horrible decision. It was viral, didn't cover all the cases it needed to, and it was observable to the user at worst changing the behavior of their program. And that's of course the case because we have the no accept operator and with that you can branch on whether the no accept is there and you can potentially execute some completely different code and not the code that we are testing, for example. So that's a horrible thing to do if you're writing unit tests. So that macro is not a good idea. Um, so um, how else can we do this, right? So it seems like we cannot throw an exception if the no accept is there. Uh, we need some other form of uh, getting out of the function without continuing to execute its body, but without returning a value and without throwing an exception. Right, so, so how do we do this? And I looked into basically all other possibilities that me or anybody I talked to could think of how to do this. There's quite a few of them. TLDR, none of them really work, but we're gonna go through them uh, anyway. The first one is, well, you could long jump out of the assert. Mm -hmm. You could make the assert macro long jump out of the function, right? So, uh, well, yeah, you can do that, but it turns out that long jump actually is undefined behavior whenever you jump out of the function and uh, there are like non-trivial destructors that would have to be called if you unwind the stack, but you don't unwind the stack because you call long jump. And so any situation like this, where you kind of skip uh, non-trivial destructors that would otherwise have to be called, uh, that is just undefined behavior in C++. So any uh, you know, meaningful C++ code that uses types with non-trivial destructors, you cannot long jump out of that function in that case. That's just UB. So, so that, that approach just totally doesn't work. The next approach that uh, I looked into was, well, uh, we could maybe use threads. We could spawn every uh, unit test in a different thread. And then whenever the assert fails, we can save some info about that, uh, uh, what failed and, and et cetera. And then we can somehow uh, put the thread to sleep indefinitely or, or make it spin an infinite loop indefinitely or something like this and basically never, never resume that thread. And then um, the unit testing framework, which runs on a different thread, uh, will then check you know, that this is what has happened. And so this kind of works, but it has a bunch of drawbacks. So first of all, it leaks memory, right? Because again, you don't call, uh, you don't call any destructors uh, uh, of like, for example, the stuff that you passed in. And that's actually really bad because you might be testing the fact that you're not leaking memory, right? So those tests would no longer work. It invalidates anything that re relies on RII, anything that relies on destructors being called, because if you just put the thread to sleep, uh, you're not going to call them ever. And again, that might be the very thing that you're testing, right? So that's not going to work. 
And on top of that, we're also leaking one thread per test case. And we have, if you have like a test suite with you know several thousand unit tests, which is not very unusual in a big code base, um, then that's not going to be good. So that doesn't really work. The next uh, approach is something that uh, Ville Votilainen suggested to me when we were talking about this. It's kind of a, a thought experiment. Uh, although he actually then uh, did like a little toy implementation of that. Um, so this is kind of an interesting approach. So instead of returning or throwing or jumping or like something like that, you actually um, have your unit test, uh, uh, your sequence of unit tests uh, uh, kind of being driven by some kind of event loop. Um, and then what you do when the assert fails, you actually don't return, but instead you call the event loop, which is then gonna just call the next test, right? And you're gonna go into the next test, and then when that assert fails, it's gonna call the event loop, and that's gonna call the next test. So it's a bit like a continuation, right? So you never actually return from the failed tests. And again, that kind of works. You can, you can put together like a kind of a setup where, where that kind of happens. But uh, again, it, it has all of the other uh, disadvantages of the other things where you never actually unwind the stack, which is it leaks memory, it breaks everything that relies on RII. And on top of that, in this approach, you also have an unbounded growth of your call stack, right? So you call, uh, uh, just keep calling kind of into more and more tests without ever returning. So at some point, you're going to have a stack overflow because your call stack just grew too large. It's also kind of really tricky to put this together. Uh, I don't know of any real world unit testing framework that actually does this in, in, in real life. So I'm not sure this is actually you know, scalable to any kind of real world scenario. So I think it's an interesting uh, thought experiment, but not really, doesn't really work, work in practice as far as I can tell. The fourth approach that has been suggested uh, to me by somebody is why don't we use signal? We could um, uh, make our assert macro uh, raise a signal, some kind of assert fail signal, and then we install our own kind of signal uh, handler to, to deal with that. Well, it turns out that doesn't work at all because signals are effectively just a callback mechanism, right? So you, yes, you can raise a signal and then you you can install your signal handler, but then you're in there, right? And so that's just a function. And again, you have the same choices. Do you just return or do you uh, throw an exception or do you terminate, like what do you do, right? So you, you didn't actually solve the problem at all, you just moved it to a different location. And that's actually going to be the case for anything that's kind of shaped like a callback. Like none of these approaches are gonna solve this problem in any way. And that leaves us with exactly one more uh, technique uh, to do this kind of testing without throwing an exception, which is, well, if we can't return, we can't throw an exception, we can't long jump, we can't do any of these other things, the only thing we can do is to terminate, terminate the process, right? So what we can do is we can launch the, the uh, test in another process, and then we can terminate that process. And in our uh, unit testing framework, we can verify that the, the process has in fact been terminated, right? This is how we uh, kind of validate our, our test there. And these death tests, uh, they come in three flavors, fork-based, clone-based, spawn-based. Let me just very quickly kind of uh, go through that. So in a fork-based death test, uh, you launch each test in a forked process. Um, and that requires a fast and reliable fork. So immediately that excludes anything that's not a Unix-like system, right? That's just not going to work on Windows. Right? So it's kind of not portable. Uh, which is very bad if you want to run your unit testing framework on Windows as well as Linux and Mac OS, which is the case for lots of software out there. Um, so that's one problem. Another problem is that if you terminate a uh, process, uh, the return value, the return code you get back, that's just eight bits of data, right? So you cannot really uh, tell the testing framework which line of code the assertion failed and anything like that. Uh, I mean, you can get around it. You can probably write that. Uh, uh, information to disk and then read it, or like there's potentially other roundabout ways of uh, getting that information back to the testing framework, but they're all going to be slow. Um, and so uh, these death tests are not actually widely available in, in any, they're not actually available in any C++ unit testing framework that I know of, except Google Test. Right? Google Test is the only uh, C++ testing, testing framework that um, offers uh, death tests. and um, they're actually really complicated to implement. So if you, for example, for, for some reason, cannot use Google test, it's not something where you can just sit down for a day and implement this, right, in, in your own unit testing framework. It is complex, 
to do correctly. And if you're a big company, big tech company, you can probably afford to do this. If you're not, then probably you can't. And then what you're going to do in practice is you're just not going to write these tests, right? You're just not going to test your preconditions when your code quality is going to suffer. So, so that's not very good. Fork-based clone uh, death test, there's also clone-based death test. This is something from the uh, Google testing uh, framework again. Uh, they write that uh, clone-based is actually more stable than fork-based uh, under certain conditions. But clone-based death tests work on Linux only, right? So it's even more restricted to just one, uh, one operating system. And then this last flavor of death tests um, is spawn-based death tests, where you actually spawn a new process uh, for every, um, for every um, uh, test case. And this is something that you can probably do on every platform that has multiple processes, but it's really complex to set up. So first of all, like no unit testing framework is not going to do that for you. You need an external framework uh, to, to do this. For example, something like Deja GNU, which is the one that libs did C++, the uh, GCC standard library uses for that purpose. Uh, you also need to move your tests into a different source file. And there's lots of other work you have to do. So this is really, really complex to set up. So again, something that probably a lot of people are just not going to bother doing. Um, and it's going to make everything more complicated. And it's also very, very slow, even on Unix-like uh, platforms. And uh, also, of course, on other platforms. So uh, spawning a new process for every test case, that's the kind of stuff that makes your uh, you know, test uh, suite run in 10 minutes instead of five seconds. And again, a lot of people are just not going to bother doing that because it slows down development so much. So, so for many use cases, this approach just doesn't really work. Um, and so maybe when we get standard contracts in C++26, hopefully, does that going to help us here at all? And it turns out, no, actually not at all. So uh, today we have assert macros. Uh, when we get contracts, we will be able to write it as a standard contract annotation that actually goes uh, before the curly brace, it goes on the uh, function declaration. There's currently two syntaxes we are considering there for uh, NST21 for this, so we haven't settled on the syntax yet. Uh, one possible syntax is this attribute-like syntax with double square brackets from uh, P2935. There's another possible syntax which looks more like this, more, more like a kind of a predicate with parens, uh, which is from uh, 2961. I'm um, not sure which one we're going to end up with, but in any case, um, you know, this kind of does the same thing as the assert macro does. And then instead of uh, implementing our assert macro by uh, throwing uh, an exception, what we do in standard contracts is we implement a standard contract violation handler, which is this function with a particular name and a particular signature, which we need to define and link into the program. And that's going to then also just throw that throw that exception, right? So it's kind of doing the same thing, um, looks differently, but does the same thing. And uh, actually throwing this uh, exception, whether you throw it out of the assert macro or out of the relation handler, uh, it doesn't matter as far as no except is concerned. If, if there's a no except there, that's still going to call the terminate, right? So you're not going to somehow subvert or break the, the no accept operator in, or the no accept keyword in, in, in C++, right? So that, that wouldn't make any sense. So if you throw uh, an exception from a standard violation handler, the exact same thing happens. If you have no accept on the function, you're going to terminate. So you're going to have all of these problems again. So um, here are my takeaways. Uh, you should test your preconditions. Uh, it's a very effective way of making sure that you wrote the precondition, making sure you wrote the correct precondition check, and then that's going to then help other people uh, to not introduce bugs into your code base because they're going to hit that precondition check if they do it wrong. By far, the most effective, simplest, and most portable method to achieve this is exception-based uh, precondition testing where you throw an exception uh, to signal that a precondition has been violated. That requires that functions with preconditions are not no except, right? That's called the Lakos rule, and we really need that rule uh, to, do these, uh, to do these tests. And the only really viable alternative to this exception-based testing uh, that actually kind of works in practice is death tests, but death tests are much more complex to set up. They're much slower. They're not portable. They only work on some platforms, but not others. Um, so 
you know, for some people and for some libraries that might be an alternative for others, it, it, it's not. So we should really uh, enable the exception-based testing because that's the portable, fast, uh, simple way of doing it. And so that's all I had. Um, thank you very much and back to Pablo. Thank you, Timur. So I have 10 minutes left. I'm gonna go deeper, but I'm gonna go very fast and focus on certain areas. May not have time for questions, hopefully I will. <clears throat> so let's talk about contract tests uh, and testing, uh, contract checks and testing in depth. This I'm gonna go through really fast because it's not really material you need to know. You can look at the slides later. Uh, so contract annotations are part of the defensive uh, software framework and they typically provide three facilities. One or more assert-like macros, a way to turn the checks on and off, and a user-settable way to control what happens when a violation happens. All right, what, and and I, I left out one thing here, which is that the assert-like macros, may, there may be some that are, that, that, or the on-off mechanism may, may have gradations. So like really fast checks could be turned on, whereas the slower checks are turned off and so on. So a, a sophisticated thing will have those too. The examples I have here don't have that, that feature. So a violation handler I just mentioned, and, and Timur mentioned as well, so some function prototype declared by the framework but supplied by the user. One or more assert-like macros. So here we have just one macro assert and then we have three synonyms for it just for making the code a little bit more self-documenting. The on-off switch here is, a, is simply a macro. It's either on or off, it, this one doesn't, doesn't supply gradations. Now I'll mention here um, the, the reason that we're using this question mark colon, the trinary operator instead of an if statement is to avoid the issues of where is the semicolon gonna go or you have a dangling else or anything like that. So uh, this is simply the, the easiest way to do that. It's an expression, you have to put a semicolon at the end of it. Fine. The contract violation handler can do Several things, it can do anything you want really, but the kinds of things it might wanna do is log the error and just continue. And you would do that in situations where you've added new checks into your, your code base. The code base has been working. You do not wanna break the code that has been working, but maybe you're, 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 you're tightening up your precondition and you're trying, trying to make the code a little bit more robust and you don't wanna bring it down in the meantime, you just wanna log and look at it later. Terminating a program, that's the typical thing to do with some good log message, hopefully. You could trigger a breakpoint in the debugger. You could end, execute an endless loop. This will effectively halt the thread. Now other threads can continue and you can also attach the debugger to the running program and find out exactly where the problem is occurring. Or you could throw an exception, which is what we've been talking about. The unit testing framework has Things like, you know, what happens when an error happens? Now we, have, we define our violation handler. This is not part of the unit testing framework. This is part of the defensive software framework, but we are responsible as the unit test authors to provide the violation handler. And in this case, it's going to throw a, a contract exception and the throw is missing from the one line of code here. <laughs> it's, it's a, it constructs a contract exception and it's not throwing it. All of this code has been passed through the compiler in my brain. And then we have some sort of macros for checking. You know, this is expression must be true in this, if this test succeeds. And then the kind of macros that Timur was talking about, if uh, we expect the test to pass, uh, that is to no precondition violations, we're going to try the, ex the expression. And if it throws, we're gonna catch the exception and say, hey, we got a violation that we weren't expecting. And then the opposite is true for the fail case, right? We, we call the expression, if it succeeds, if it, if it returns, then we say, hey, we should have had a violation that was caught, but we didn't catch it. So we put it all together. We have our uh, operator uh, square brackets. I told you we were gonna build a vector here. Um, and we're checking the, the index is in range uh, as a precondition check, but we have a bug in our precondition check. So we catch this bug. Here, in this second to last line, 
Uh, one is uh, going to return true for this expression because we put less than or equal instead of less than. And we detect this bug because we expected an, a, a, a precondition violation to be fired, and it didn't fire. So this is where I really want to focus their attention. No accept in depth here. And I've got five minutes. Okay. Um, so no accept, what was it really for? It was added late in C++11 for a very specific reason, and that was to make vector work and be performant. It can reduce code size, but that's not what it was for. It can make your code more self-documenting, because it tells you which functions don't throw, but that's not what it was for either. If you don't use it with the noaccept operator, it doesn't make your code faster. Right? The noaccept operator is a very deliberate choice to branch and do different, run different code. It's not just something that the optimizer can take advantage of. It makes your code smaller, but it does not make it faster. So let's look at the intended use of noaccept in our reallocation of a vector. Right? Vectors can grow, they can shrink it now, um, and uh, when that happens, you need to allocate a new contiguous chunk of memory, move all the elements into that new chunk of memory, and then get rid of the old chunk of memory. So we start by allocating memory. Now I'm going to use the actual allocator traits, which is a little bit of a complex mechanism, but just think of it as a way to call functions in the allocator. And we're using it to allocate memory here, and that's our new data. And now we're going to loop over the elements, moving them over from the one to the other. But there's a problem. If, while moving the elements, an exception gets thrown, what happens? All right, so we're going to branch here uh, depending on whether a move might throw. If a move will not throw, that's what this no accept and this expression is constructing a t from an r value of t, right? That's calling the move constructor. If calling the move constructor is guaranteed not to throw, then we are going to construct our elements using move. On the other hand, if it might throw, we're going to construct our elements using the copy constructor, which is more expensive. And if it throws, we have to unwind everything we did. We have to destroy all the copies that we made. We have to deallocate the memory that we allocated, and then we have to rethrow the exception. Okay, more complicated and more expensive. So I mentioned that the reason that we're doing this is to keep the strong guarantee in vector. What does that mean? Well, there are three basic exception guarantees. There's the no-throw guarantee, this thing will not throw. And if it tries to throw, it'll terminate. Then there's the basic guarantee that no resources are leaked or corrupted. As somebody in a previous talk said, that's kind of why do they even call it an exception guarantee? It's just the guarantee. No function should ever corrupt data or leak resources, right? And then the strong exception guarantee says that if an exception is thrown, we're going to return the world to as close as possible to the state before the function was ever called. It's not as useful as you might think. You might think that is the gold standard, right? And it kind of is, but it's not that useful because if the, function, if the op, uh, object that you are working on doesn't survive the unwinding, you've gained nothing. And it's not really encouraged for new functions. It's kind of complex, it's easy to get wrong, uh, and you lose performance typically because you're making extra copies to make sure that you can roll things back. So the no accept operator is typically to, to optimize this condition, which we just said is something you shouldn't have very often. But Vector had it before C++11, before move was introduced, and we wanted to keep it. We couldn't remove the strong guarantee. So that's why it was really specific for Vector. So, boy, running out of time. The basic exception guarantee we show here, we just loop over the elements, we call our operation on the elements. If the operation fails, what happens if it throws? We don't have le resource leakage. Nothing here is allocating and failing to deallocate. Uh, but V is in a partially transformed state. Okay, so that's the basic guarantee. Now, if V doesn't survive the unwinding, we've lost nothing. The strong guarantee we make a copy of V first, and we operate on the copy, and then if all the transformation works, we swap it for the original. That's the strong guarantee, right? Much more expensive, and it might run out of memory. 
In this case, if it throws, no resistors are leaked and V is left unchanged. Okay, so no accept is for this reason. Let's optimize the strong guarantee. If the thing will not throw, we do the simple thing. If it might throw, we go through the normal copy and then swap. Again, it's expensive, it might exhaust memory. Uh, this impacts versioning. If we have a version of a function that has no accept and then later we decide, oh, we're gonna widen the contract, which is typically a safe thing to do, uh, we, what happens with the new inputs? Is this the same? Can you use the new version where the old one was used? No, it's not substitutable because we have a change of behavior. We might run out of memory whereas before we were guaranteed not to. So if you put a no accept specifier on something, it's there forever. It's not a compiler optimization that's used by the code. It's, it's visible to the code. You can't just add and remove it later. Uh, it has negative effects on testing as we've seen. If you, uh, it has negative effects on versioning. So the Lakos rule, Timmer went through it, so I will just very quickly just put this up, the slide up there. If you have a narrow contract, don't put no accept on it. In addition, it's not as useful as you might think, all right? It's, it's important when you need it, but you don't need it very often because we don't have the strong guarantee that often. You don't need the strong guarantee that often. So don't agonize over it. Use it for default constructors if it won't throw. Use it for move constructors if they won't throw. That's the classic case. The move constructor will be efficient inside the vector. And for trivial functions, it's okay. It's not necessary, but it's okay. Otherwise, don't use it. Now I'm gonna really quickly, really quickly go through an alternative that I proposed to the standards committee that throws nothing attribute. It's in this paper and it's the idea is to use it like no except but without the pitfalls. All right, you can use it to reduce code size. You can use it on functions with narrow contracts. You can use it to make the code more self-documenting. All these off-label uses of no except go away. You just use throws nothing. It doesn't affect, the important thing is it doesn't affect the meaning of a correct program. It's not detectable by the no accept operator. That's the important change. What happens if, a, if you violate that? You throw an exception from the throws nothing function. Well, it's implementation defined. And that means typically your compiler flags will tell you what's gonna happen. It might do nothing and just let the exception escape and that's useful. Uh, you, it could terminate like no accept it could call the contract violation handler. So in the first case, if we do nothing, that allows us to do the unit testing that Timmer was just showing, right? If we terminate, it might makes the code size smaller because you don't have all the exception tables. And if you uh, call the contract violation handler, then you treat a, a, a failure, a, 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 a unexpected exception as a contract failure. Oops, sorry, let's go back. Um, so in conclusion, all right, Write your contracts, test your contracts, um, uh, write your contracts, check your preconditions and postconditions when you can, when you can write it in code that's efficient. Uh, test your contracts and then minimize your use of no accept. Follow the Lakos rule and uh, don't use no accept with narrow contracts. And I believe I am over time now, so I will stay here for uh, a few minutes and answer questions, um, but I, I think the session is officially over. Thank you.